Welcome to the Asia Society. I'm Tom Nagorski. Literally not to the Asia Society, but uh, to the Asia Society suite of online global programs, uh, which those of you who've been following know we are doing with as much regularity as we can. Uh, I'm speaking to you this afternoon from uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, now the epicenter of uh, the outbreak, hopefully not for long. Uh, and we come to a subject today in our coverage of the virus and its global impact that we have not touched on in one of these events so far. It's not a public health question. It's not an economic question. It goes to one of the nastier uh, byproducts, you could say, of the coronavirus outbreak, and that is the racism, discrimination, and xenophobia that we have seen in the weeks and months that have followed, not only in the United States, but around the world. Uh, we aim today to shed light on the issue and to discuss what uh, the shedding of light can what beyond shedding of light can be done to stop it. Uh, the title of event, this event may say it best, viruses and pathogens do not discriminate. Of course, it's an important issue for all of us at the Asia Society, but we'd like to think it's an important issue and a question for folks all over the world, wherever they may be. We're joined today by two terrific guests uh, to get at the issue in two different parts uh, of the country. Charlie Wu is in Los Angeles. He is the co-founder and CEO of Megatoys, a longtime champion for the Asian American community in LA, longtime member of the Committee of 100. Great to have Charlie Wu with us. Good and Lisa morning. Lin, who makes her home in London, uh, is actually joining us today uh, from Boston. Uh, Lisa is assistant professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, she joins us, as I say, from Boston, Massachusetts. She's a member and alumna uh, of the Asia 21 Young Leaders Network of the Asia Society. Our regular reminder today that uh, for those of you watching, whether you are on the Facebook Live or YouTube platforms, you can answer questions, you can ask questions or leave comments for us at the comment uh, function of either of those two platforms. Uh, and as we start, uh, I wanna say and stipulate, although we'll probably cover both of these interchangeably uh, in this conversation, we really seem to be talking about two things. Uh, on the one hand, the really nasty in your face uh, acts and actions uh, of racism that we have seen, uh, again, all over the world, uh, documented by uh, people like Charlie Wu at the Committee of 100 and many others, uh, where we've seen uh, Asian Americans get yelled at, hollered at, uh, go back to your country, particularly in the initial days directed against Chinese and Chinese Americans, but as I said, not exclusively. And then there's the whole issue of the nomenclature uh, that's been attached to the outbreak itself, the so-called Chinese virus, the Wuhan virus, and the issues around that. But let me start, uh, Lisa Lin and Charlie Wu, with just a fundamental question. Uh, we are, I guess, uh, two, three months now since the reports of the first cases, three full months, really. And I wonder, uh, starting with you, Lisa, you were in London at the time. Uh, and I want to ask how you first came uh, to either experience directly or indirectly or just hear about it. Uh, some of these things we're talking about. So uh, we have students uh, in London that uh, in the greater like United Kingdom uh, that have been on the receiving end of racism comments and also physically attacked. Even while walking as a group on the street and, and uh, a colleague who is also a mother of two had a cooking pot thrown at her and was then pushed down a staircase along with her children. So uh, people who look East Asian, so not just Chinese, but East Asian ethnicity, uh, or wearing a mask, have become targets of verbal or physical abuse, unfortunately. So this has caused a direct and indirect impact on the entire community, um, especially in London, where I was based. Everything you just described actually happened in London? Uh, yes. Yeah, and Charlie Wu, you said, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that you were hearing about it sort of more indirectly. Can you, when and how did you first come to realize that this phenomenon was 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 underway and really something to, to be reckoned with? You know, as, you know, as we know that the virus starts spreading in uh, China about, you know, uh, we heard about about January, but it was perceived as an Asian disease at that time. It didn't really threaten Americans. so. And as Chinese American, we monitor it, but we didn't really think that would threaten us. But near February, when we discovered that uh, 
there were some cases being discovered in the United States, and then there was quite a bit of fear among Americans that this disease would come here. And then uh, I got, because of my role in Committee 100, I chaired the Public Policy Committee. And the press often call me for information for quotes. And about mid to late February, reporters are calling me about reports of you know, Chinese being feeling uncomfortable because when they wear when they wear masks, they would look at funny. They did people thought that they had disease. And then uh, the Chinese business, Chinese restaurants are start losing their business because uh, people are fearful of going to places where Chinese hang out. So. My, at that point, I still didn't think it was that serious. You know, I've been an American for the last 50 years. And to me, you know, racial incidents happen, isolated incidents happen all the time. And sometimes you don't want to make it worse by publicizing it. And so that you can encourage others to sort of join in that terrible behavior. So I thought, let's just watch and wait. And I encourage Asian Americans or Chinese Americans, if they feel comfortable wearing masks. If they think that protect them, they should wear them regardless of what people, how people look at them. Because in, in this country, yes, it's a free country. You're supposed, as long as you don't offend people, you should be fine to do what you think is appropriate to protect yourself. And of course, I point out there was a mis, it's a cultural disconnect here in Asia where people wear masks to protect themselves from you know, pollution, from disease. In this country, people perceive those people that wear masks to be sick. But I said, you might have to explain it, but, but let's hope that as long as this thing do not become an uh, American disease, that people are not gonna forget about it soon. But obviously things get worse in, in March, and then, you know, then we know the rest of the story, and then the violence, the assault, and the abuse, the harassment keep increasing. So that's sort of how I gradually, around, Beginning the middle of March, I realized this was a really serious problem because Americans start dying, people getting more nervous, anxiety, increased anxiety would create more fear and prejudice. And you said uh, to me before this call, Charlie, that uh, uh, one of the things that made you realize um, that this wasn't just a short, small thing, uh, you, you had friends or just acquaintances or maybe you just heard about them in the Chinese American community who are actually buying up guns because they got so scared. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, when, you know, because as the news spread, you know, I'm in Los Angeles, we have a large Asian and Chinese American community. So there was a lot of tension within the community to this issue and then people start worrying, people want to protect themselves. And then not only do they buy up food and supplies, you know, there's news report that Asian Americans actually buy up arms, firearms, ammunition. And I thought that was a really dangerous situation. And then let me share some statistics with you because there are different uh, civil rights organizations, Asian American organizations put up different websites to encourage people to report. One particular site in California, and they, in the last week, there are about, you know, about over 650 reports in just one week. So it averaged about almost 100 a day. And... Uh, 60% of those victims that report the crimes were non-Chinese. So this is not a thing that directed at Chinese Americans or Chinese, but Pan-Asian as well. And, uh, and also uh, women report incidents three times more than men. So it looked like the perpetrator would pick on what they perceived to be a weaker you know, Asian American. So that's one thing to, uh, to, you know, to pay attention to. And then uh, about two thirds of the reports are verbal harassments, verbal assaults, and about one quarter are sort of shunning that, you know, when a Chinese walk up and people run away and stay away from you, and about 13%, you know, are actual physical violence. And then uh, including being coughed at, uh, spat at, and being beat up, and, uh, and there's a physical, you know, violence, and they're actual victims. I don't know if you heard that uh, about a couple of weeks ago in Texas, in this in Inside Sam's Club, an Asian family, I believe it was Southeast Asian family, a father with two kids, they were stabbed and sent to the hospital because the perception was they carry the virus. So this, this thing no, long, you know, no longer just make us feel bad and hurt our feeling. It actually could 
you know, could have become a safety issue for Asian Americans or Asian living around the world. Lisa Lin, if we can come back to you, you've referred to a phenomenon that, uh, I mean, you're a public health professional uh, and uh, I guess a student of not just the current situation, but of past uh, outbreaks. Um, they're all different, but you, you've referred to something you call the othering, uh, which uh, has followed past outbreaks. Can you explain that phenomenon, uh, where it's happened before and, and whether you think it's happening now? Yeah. And to echo uh, what Charles just said, for example, I think uh, experts in London and Europe uh, who fit that profile, the East Asian, Asian, uh, and Asian uh, feel unsafe and unwelcome in their respective countries. And then many have left, actually, uh, because of that uh, during this outbreak. And then to come back to the other ring. So um, when diseases are thought to be lethal, uh, people sometimes cope with their fears uh, cope with their fears by blaming new disease outbreaks on someone or some group uh, of people who live outside of their own social uh, sphere. Often, um, those who have uh, like national or ethnic or religious backgrounds are different from the those of mainstream, uh, either mainstream population or mainstream media uh, that has historically been accused of spreading the disease. Uh, it doesn't matter whether this subgroup is actually belong to the respective country that we're talking about, or is it from like a uh, outside uh, new immigrants or expat? Um, in general, like this group of population who fit that profile being blamed. So uh, the spread of racism and xenophobia through the media actually uh, is frequently found in the event of an epidemic. Um, mass media, uh, as we know, that is significant. It plays a significant role in disseminating information during the public health emergency. Uh, the framing of the, the media uh, draws attention on certain aspects of the issue. And then in the case of the epidemic, can often feel public fear and discrimination. So such framing, uh, that's what we call as a othering, a subgroup in the society, which is a procedure of alienating, alienating one sub-community from the rest of the population. So as, a, of the, as the one who is like responsible for the outbreak. So this creates a divide uh, of them who, who is this particular group. For example, uh, in the past, it was an African, Amer uh, African community during Ebola, and then now it's the Chinese or East Asian community during this coronavirus outbreak versus us with the general population, and which actually uh, is uh, the over the existing racial and political tensions. Um, this is done on, not only through uh, narratives, but also through like images that are shown um, to the audience uh, as part of the news story, for example. Um, does, so does, it's, uh, it's a difficult position. Does it also, Lisa, start to have, uh, in, in addition to uh, just being a, a nasty and, and pernicious uh, thing anyhow. You've also suggested that it can have a public health impact, a negative oh. one. Can you explain that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, when this type of things happens, uh, it prevent it basically um, those who are likely to be ill and then they might be delaying seeking testing uh, or care due to the fear of discrimination or uh, even like from going outside. Uh, those who might be sick or healthy and be thinking of putting on the mask, and in this case, uh, are afraid to do so. Um, this may not be helpful during an outbreak when we need everybody to cooperate in identifying potential cases during contact tracing, uh, in identifying an outbreak in the community. And then historically, we have seen that discrimination might affect the subcommunities trust in the government's response, medical response, and uh, co cooperation in epidemic control. In the current context, like, for example, like uh, we see that this pandemic now is definitely bigger than any one country can handle. Um, however, that this discrimination at the large term that can damage international cooperation. Um, and then at individual level, it creates a false perception around the community that transmission uh, in terms of from whom one could be more likely to contract the disease 
then uh, and then if and yeah, in other words, right, not only does this narrative create an untrue perception that some members of society might pose a greater, higher risk to the community, but also a false sense of security that other members, based on their appearance alone, may be exempt from social distancing or physical distancing practice. Right. Which, of course, now the world doesn't need any reminder of that, of course, because you might as well call it an American or a European virus at the moment if you were going to do that. Now, let's get to this whole issue of, of naming, right? Um, and I don't know, this is, I guess, a little more subtle, but maybe it isn't. Uh, for some time, as, as you both know, and, and many around this country and around the world know, President Trump uh, was calling it the Chinese virus. Uh, his Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, I think still refers to it, and so do a lot of other public health officials and a lot of people in certain corners of the media here and so on and so forth as the China virus, the Chinese virus, the Wuhan virus. Mm -hmm. Charlie Wu, maybe I can ask you because um, I, you know, uh, there, there are people who ask a fundamental question, and I think we know the answer, but I'd like you to give it for us. A uh, hundred years ago, there was something that, not just a hundred years ago, but for a long, long time, has been referred to as um, the Spanish influenza. Uh, we've had the German measles, and even MERS, which is a much more uh, recent uh, outbreak, uh, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. West Nile has a geographic uh, uh, you know, title. So explain, please, what is wrong with Chinese virus as a term? Start with you, Charlie. Okay, yes. When I first heard the term, as much as I didn't like it, I thought that was the way, uh, that, was the way that you know, we name it. And then I started doing some research, by the way, we call the 1918 influenza, the Spanish flu. It turned out that it probably originated from the United States in, the, in Kansas, not in Spain. But you know, that goes to show how accurate when you name a, a, a disease after a location, because it was just simply wrong information. And then when I did some research, it turned out that in 2015, the World Health Organization had published a set of guidelines, best practice for naming disease. And it specifically mentioned that when you name a disease or virus, you have the name has to include some information about the nature of the disease, the nature of the virus, provide useful medical scientific information. And we should not name a disease or virus after a, after a location, after a city, a country, an ethnic group, or a culture. Because that would not only confuse the public, and create confusion in science and, and scientific and medical research, it would stigmatize a country, a place, and, and a culture. And it was very clear in 2000, whatever we did it, prior to 2015, you know, we probably didn't do a good job in naming the disease. But I thought after 2015, we should be clear, particularly those in the scientific community, you know, science and medicine need a global unified terminology in order to communicate. And you just, each country, each group cannot name their own disease and name their own uh, virus. And so that we need a translator to connect one disease in one country to another disease. That's just not the way science and medicine being done. So it's really important that we stick to a technical term that is universally adopted. And, and, and then the disease called COVID-19 was the, the official name, and for those in government and in, in authority that, that are dictating public policy, they should know better than using terms that have been already disregarded by the scientific community. And when you talk about this, one of the first things that they mention is, yeah, but then it originated from China, and China did not do a good job. China mishandled it. China did the cover-up, and, and then if China had done the right thing, the world would have been, might have been able to prevent it and minimize the damage. No, you know, it is still too early to, to, to put blames. And I think history and science would, would look into this issue, would find with the blame, where, who was at fault, who, who should be more responsible, what we learn from it. But at this point, our focus should be on how to save lives and not to start blaming people and pointing fingers. And I, you know, even before the pre uh, president 
Trump called it a Chinese virus. And there were public officials in the beginning of March, there was a couple of US senators, one called the, the disease started because Chinese uh, eat bats. And then another senator passed on a conspiracy theory that the virus was an accident in a China by a weapon laboratory and then somehow a virus got leaked out. And then, and then was, you know, and then there were various public officials so that start pointing the fingers at China and called the China, Chinese virus before the president took it on. To President Trump's credit, he took it back. And yeah. as we all know, President Trump doesn't take back a lot of things. He doesn't apologize. Well, this one case, I think he even President Trump, to give him credit, President Trump recognized the damage that, that a wrong terminology could cause and he took it back. So I think that, you know, all the government officials should follow. I want to come back to that in a second, because it's a really good point. President Trump's change of heart just in the last week or so. Um, Lisa, uh, Charlie mentioned in, in that answer uh, several times that the scientific and medical community should come up with uh, just a, a protocol or a, a, mm -hmm. a recommendation or a way to, to, uh, uh, to go about the naming uh, yeah. of these pathogens when it's appropriate. So, of course, you are on this program at least representing the scientific and medical community. And you've, I know you've given a lot of thought to this. So how should, uh, for, for in this case or going forward, uh, what would you recommend uh, in yeah. terms of, of how we give these things names? And I'm really glad uh, that Charlie mentioned uh, the guideline uh, that the WHO issued around like how to name on a uh, new disease. Uh, that guideline was published officially in 2015, and then uh, and then again actually uh, this year they because of the COVID-19 there was another guideline around like how to how to describe this. I think the fundamental line, I, uh, I'm going to quote uh, WHO here because I think it was, it, was, it was very important in setting up the tone. So basically saying that using crimin criminalizing or dehumanizing terminology creates the impression that uh, people with a disease have somehow done something wrong or are less human than the rest of us and which will feed into stigma and undermine uh, empathy. So uh, it is very important that we use the right uh, word and word choice uh, when describing disease and also when describing um, the, like, think the, the epidemiological like, uh, aspect of like, what we are dealing with right now. And, and this will help us in coming together uh, in putting up a, a effective uh, epidemic control effort. And then coming back to your question, so just to give an example, um, so, for example, we should uh, use the term like new coronavirus, uh, disease, uh, new corona disease or COVID-19 instead of like, uh, instead of everything that Charlie just mentioned. Uh, we actually did a correction in 2009 when H1N1 uh, was initially used as referred to as swine flu. So we use H1N1 to replace swine flu for exactly the reason that Charlie just mentioned. Uh, the other thing for us, the other example, for example, uh, is like we should talk about people who acquire or contract uh, COVID-19 uh, and do not talk about people who are transmitting COVID-19 or infecting others or spreading the virus. Because it, this implies an intention. Uh, it's an intentional transmission or an, an assigned blame on people who actually obviously was innocent in doing that. That, that's a really interesting point, and that actually, I guess, has nothing to do with race or ethnicity, but you're saying that it sh there should be a, a verb, if you will, that isn't so active. So what did you recommend? That, that it's okay to say contracting, Yeah, right? contract or, or acquire. Acquire, right, rather than spread, transmit. Okay, all right. Um, we have a question, by the way, that goes right to uh, the heart of what you're talking about here, and this would be a question for you, Lisa Lynn. Uh, it comes from somebody watching on YouTube. Researching and mapping the spread of any virus would be useful to educate people about the course of the spread. Do you think this mapping is useful or detrimental to avoiding racial discrimination? So I guess the question is, if you've got to map it, you need to know where it's from. Mm -hmm. uh, does that then get you into the same problem, or I assume there's ways around it? 
No, I, I think this is a very uh, helpful and very important question to ask. And then uh, just maybe I'll echo to what you just described and also what Charlie described is that um, scientists and uh, epidemiologists, we have anticipated a like, pandemic at this scale for many, many years. We knew that it was coming. We just didn't know when and where. Whether or not we have prepared well for this uh, outbreak, uh, that's another conversation. But we do know that a pandemic or a novel disease would hit us sooner or later. Just like, for example, like Bill Gates had been like talking about this uh, for many, many years, uh, at least for five, six years, and he'd been preparing for it. We have always had the Pandemic Awareness Act, for example, in the United States. So this could have come from, so the, the point is that this uh, outbreak or this pandemic could have come from anywhere. Um, and, then, uh, and then I think that this is be important to keep in mind. And then I think as a global citizen and for individual countries, it, it is very important that they, uh, for countries that have the outbreak that originally from, should notify the international community, WHO, and then to like uh, WHO and the international community, like immediately as soon as they figure out what it is. So uh, just to get, like there are definitely like, uh, mismanagement of the uh, in, uh, early, uh, early warning, early detection that happened in China, um, that, that's something else. But and I think in terms of, if we are looking at the dates, they notify the WHO on December 31st, that's as early as we have in the record. And then they notify the US CDC in the first week of, of January and sharing uh, gene sequencing within like a week or two and then, uh, and has been reporting cases and epidemic control measures since then. And then, so we see them putting put uh, strict uh, containment efforts, uh, limiting the spread within the Wuhan, uh, Wuhan uh, city and then the Hubei province in January and February. So in terms of a, a global like responsibility, I, I do think that China has put up uh, a numerous effort, uh, even at, uh, at the expense of their economic growth uh, in containing the virus and notify the uh, international community. And then so it gives us, uh, give the rest of the world, probably I think by now the two months or more, uh, the time to respond to this, uh, to this outbreak and to this pandemic. And therefore, I think that it is, go back to the question is, it is absolutely helpful to have the mapping. It's absolutely helpful to have the testing done so that we can track where things are. And looking at East Asian countries, so we're looking and even like countries or regions, uh, just to be exact. So we are looking at Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. Uh, Japan is a different case. Uh, we are now looking at the, in the different way in light of like Olympics or that. But then if we're looking at Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore, these places uh, are, bit, are the, the ones who have been affected in the first wave. And then look at how they have like a come up, like all, they have all effectively brought this first wave under control. And they have provided the rest of the world critical information about this virus and brought time for preparation. So I think that uh, in terms of mapping, uh, it's definitely helpful that to know where things are and then where it's going. That's very helpful in, for us to do uh, epidemic preparedness and control. But at the same time, I think for politicians, um, naming this as Chinese virus or China virus is not only hurting their members of sub-communities within their own countries, but then they also hurt the possibility of the collaboration and also could have like distracting uh, the public with like what they're supposed to be doing for their own, for their own people. Yeah, it's a really good point. We also have a really good point coming in over YouTube, which I think it's more of a comment than a question. And uh, I'll just read it and you can comment if you like, or we can move to the next. But uh, I hear stories of police in rural America stopping people with out of state license plates and sending them back if they don't have a good reason to be there. Do you think some deeper xenophobia is developing even among people from the same race, same country, different states in America? not just confined to Asians and Chinese. And I don't know, I mean, from, from my standpoint, I suppose 
you could say that right now there's a discrimination against people from New York City because I would imagine uh, other parts of the country here, you know, they, they don't really want New Yorkers getting on planes or crossing their borders. Personally, I don't take that as discriminatory. I mean, I'm <laughs> blessed to say I'm feeling fine, but it is an interesting observation, right? I don't know if either of you want to comment on it, that uh, there is going to be some, uh, uh, whether based on science or ignorance or, or something else, uh, anybody who is, is in any way attached to a place that has had a big outbreak is going to be, I guess, suspect, right? Yeah. So I think that this actually has been observed uh, in not only like um, like now towards uh, New Yorkers, uh, but also in Europe when Italy first had the, uh, who still suffer from the huge uh, pandemic uh, outbreak right now. Um, and then within China, um, people who live in Wuhan also have the same experience. Um, I think this actually will maybe come to uh, the discussion we might be uh, having next is about how do leaders, um, leadership people who are in the leadership positions to address this issue as a whole. Um, I think it's one thing about uh, testing and mapping and to identify like how to, or the best strategy to contain the virus. But then the other thing is attaching um, like this, uh, stigmatizing and then also discriminating uh, like a group of people uh, with, uh, based on their locations. So, um, so that, I don't know if maybe we can talk about like yeah. uh, what the government can do uh, moving forward. Um, I think, uh, I think President Trump actually yesterday, uh, I think they back out on the idea of, uh, of potentially quarantine or lockdown, uh, the tri-state area. Uh, I think that at this moment in time, during any large scale public health crisis, solid leadership and responsible media reporting uh, would be the, is, will be the most effective agencies and then very important uh, role to play to, uh, to properly frame the message and to direct public opinions. I think government officials, even school administrators, uh, media and anyone in the position of leadership should be proactive and, and taking a stand on this. Um, starting with a like, proper choice of words, as we just discussed, uh, framing the message in the right way um, around epidemic control. And then to really, I think, focus, direct the energy and the, uh, and, and the attention to effective like epidemic control, but also to like build the community solidarity. Mm -hmm. I think this is a time that we come together instead of like being like divided apart. We should yep. be, I think in China, actually what they have done well is uh, on this term, they, there, was, there was a strong uh, solidarity like built around uh, the Wuhan and Hubei province. So uh, people like across, across the, the country, they started to have the so-called Wuhan Jiao or Hubei Jiao. They understand the impact that, that by locking down Wuhan, um, they uh, they take a big hit, but then also being responsible and take care of the rest of the country, the, yeah. the people. So from being like uh, being uh, contracted or uh, acquiring disease. So I think having that sort of either you want to call it a campaign, like coming from top down or a bottom up approach from the community would be extremely helpful to so let people know that we are still together and that we know what you're sacrificing for all of us and then, then we are here to help. I think this will be very important. Then we can come together, uh, come out of this as a stronger community instead of a divided community. That's very well said, Lisa Lin, now you, and you've answered uh, in part what I was gonna turn to next, which is- I mean, Can I address that point? You know, sure, I, I, go ahead, Charlie. I had a specific question for you, but go ahead. Okay, yeah, I just want to add that when President Trump uh, stopped Chinese citizens from traveling to the United States since February 2nd, and he took credit as that's a big major measure to slow down the spread of the virus. And I think he might have been right. And I don't think anybody would blame him for stopping visitors in China. Uh, and, then, and, and, and then 
it, because it was based on the reason, because that's where the disease came from, versus when you stop people in the street and not asking where they come from, and whether they are ill or not, but instead looking, judge them by the skin of the color, by the culture, by the language. I think that's the difference. Right. When, when you stop something for a reason, for public policy reason, that's very different from stopping somebody from coming into the country and traveling based on race, ethnicity, and just appearance. I think that's yeah. a major difference. It's a really good point, and I'm glad you made it. I, in the whole question of how best to respond, I do want to come back. We've mentioned it a couple of times now. But, but you, you know, you are among many, many hats you wear, Charlie Wu. You, you are a very strong champion and an advocate for the Asian American community, not just the Chinese American community. You've done that for a long time, particularly in Southern California. So the question of, of advocacy and what works and what doesn't, I think, is a good one to bring to you. But I, I have to say that about a week ago, I think it was, in this thing, you, you lose track of time sometimes, but about a week ago, I read a whole article about uh, this issue of the president uh, calling it the uh, Chinese virus. You were quoted in that article, I think it was in the New York Times, uh, criticizing and condemning that. And it was very soon after that the president put out his tweet, and it's maybe worth reading, quote, this is President Trump, it is very important that we totally protect our Asian American community and the spread of the virus is not their fault. So Charlie Wu, do you think you, uh, as a as a prominent outspoken person on this, do you think you helped change President Trump's mind? And I think the public pressure, the community pressure on this issue has been extraordinary. I think the Asian, com Asian American community have, has come a long way in terms of protecting their rights and advocating the positions. But I think that's only the beginning. Just, you know, but in order to really combat racism, you have to do more than that. You have to engage in public education. I believe that most of those you know, racist comments are due to ignorance, lack of education, lack of knowledge, fear. And I think you have to really, it's upon us to educate those that are around us and for public officials, for people of influence to engage in public education so that for those that are ignorant, that they get better knowledge, they realize what's right, what's wrong. But of course we have elements in this country that are just simply racist. And they just take every opportunity to, to exercise their racism to hurt other people. And I, and I think it is important that those that, that engage in racist activity with bad intention need to know there should be appropriate consequence. They have to face you know, some consequence of their own action that are so damaging. And I, and I think education, public education, and increased discussion and knowledge, as well as appropriate law enforcement, and, and create some kind of retaliation for those that in, initiate engage in racist activities. I think that has to come hand in hand. Do you think, Charlie Wu, that there have been, um, in this country or anyone else, are there public officials, celebrities who you think have been particularly helpful? In, uh, in their advocacy, or some you wish would be more helpful? I think we see spokesperson from the entertainment industry, celebrities, sports figures, and, uh, and, and, and I, I think it's really more important that regardless how strong you know, we advocate for ourselves, Asian Americans is still a minority in this country with 6% of the population. So we need to build collaboration, we need other groups that understand, they're sympathetic to what we have been going through, the African American, African American community, the Latino community, the Jewish community, I think they have experienced racism, you know, one way or another in, in history, and a lot of them experienced different kind of racism. So we should come together and support each other and build a stronger coalition, and then, you know, and then, and then, uh, on top of that, I think Asian Americans, sometimes we're perceived as the perpetual foreigners, that we don't belong. And I, I think that's a wrong perception that we have to correct. And I think Asian Americans probably are the most loyal Americans because we choose our citizens. This is our choice. We become American by choice because we believe in American value because we want to contribute. I think this is time to demonstrate that 
not only do we want to protect our own rights, we want to make this a better country. That's why Committee 100 just recently, just last week, raised a million dollars to buy personal protective equipment you know, uh, to, 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 to fill the shortage of equipment and, and gloves and masks and ventilators so that we, in the moment of crisis, we are proactively you know, contributing as Americans. So we are just one of the in a larger community of being loyal Americans. I think that's a very important point to make also. Very well said. Um, I do want to come to one more question from online. We have time maybe for, for a couple more uh, in total. Now, um, we just talked a moment ago about uh, this, I don't know whether xenophobia is the right term, but the fact that some Americans were uh, from state to state acting up against one another. Uh, so we had a question here um, about people in Wuhan and the allegation that uh, I've just dropped the question. Oh, here it is. Many Chinese are saying the Wuhan people, uh, I lost it again, but the people in Wuhan basically are being ostracized, discriminated against, you might say, by people in the rest of China. So is that just the mirror image of a New Yorker right now yeah. <laughs> being ostracized uh, or at least... Uh, uh, you know, we maybe make people anxious. Lisa Lin, can you speak to, I mean, was it the case that, that uh, yeah. uh, residents of Wuhan or Hubei province had this kind it of problem? Is, it it's definitely was the case, especially at the initial, uh, initial, initial maybe like days of this outbreak uh, at that time. And then uh, probably is what you are experiencing right now as a New Yorker. Uh, but then I think there were uh, sentiments and then also like a, a solidarity that came afterwards that I, I think it was for absolutely by the, uh, it's, a, it's a mobilization by the community that started to, you, we started to see it became a trend and then uh, very, uh, it went like, uh, uh, it was like very, uh, it was, it was quite a movement in the social media that we can see. Um, and then, and then, because I'm also doing social, social media uh, surveillance right now. And then, so we saw the wave of like solidarity, like from online and also on the ground support uh, to the Wuhan, Wuhan city and the Hubei province. So it is definitely, uh, it, it definitely happened. Uh, and I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on right now. I'm, not, I'm hoping that it's like a, it's died down. Like after now the epidemic, at least the first wave in China is like almost like coming to the end. So, uh, but I do think that being proactive about um, countermeasures um, and then being like uh, proactive about showing support to the people who are suffering, I think that would be very important. I think when discrimination and racism, or in this case, like it's, uh, stigmatization towards one community that happens, I think the victims can become cast as problem itself instead of uh, as opposed to the victims of the problem. So I think this is very important that we be able to shed the lights and then to help people to see what the real issue is and then how we can come together as a community. So I, uh, I think we have time for one more question, and, and it's this one. Uh, and in a way, we, we, every time we have a conversation about the public health situation, we, we ask, are you optimistic, are you pessimistic? Maybe a little more complex than that. When we ask about the economic impact, we ask the same thing in one way or another. But I'd ask you both for just brief comments. Lisa, maybe we start with you. Uh, do you think that this outbreak, I don't mean the plan words, but uh, of racist uh, sentiment is something that will pass like the virus itself? Or do you think this is a real setback uh, in terms of uh, this sort of behavior longer term? So uh, I can only draw from, um, I hopefully, like for, for obviously I would like to hope that this will go away after the pandemic goes away. Uh, I think that uh, I can only draw from historical like experience. And um, so during the H1N1 pandemic, um, which originally in, in North America and quickly spread across the world. So uh, at that time, there was not 
any discrimination against North Americans, definitely not, not to the U.S., uh, not to Americans. Um, however, within the U.S. community, uh, Mexican Americans were heavily discriminated against. Uh, I think the discrimination and stigmatization attached to H1N1 onto that sub-community eventually faded away because the threat was like, uh, went away. However, I think the scar is over there. And then I think the, uh, the memory of it, obviously the experience of it uh, was still that behind, like beyond, like beyond the, the epidemic or pandemic of the time. Um, so therefore, I think that this experience as among the Chinese or East Asian or Asian community um, has to be addressed uh, proactively. We are just at the beginning of it uh, yeah. in the U.S. And then this will go on for another uh, three months, maybe. Yeah. Um, we are going to see, unfortunately, a rising death toll um, in confirmed cases. And therefore, I think I, I was really sad to hear, like, to hear, like Charlie said, that uh, Asian Americans felt like they need to arm themselves to protect themselves. And then, so I think this experience, uh, unfortunately, would be uh, lingering for quite some time, unless if hopefully like, we can do something about it um, as a community together. I think this, this webcast will be something that's a, like a one form, um, mm -hmm. but then perhaps like, we can do something else uh, to be like more underground as a community movement, etc. It's something we can hopefully do. Charlie Wu, I want to give you the last word here, um, or at least the answer to the last question. Are you hopeful? on this, this, this idea of whether this is a short-term setback for Asian and Asian Americans? And I think in this country, you know, racism to, to some degree has always existed. You know, going back to as Asian Americans, the Chinese exclusion at the Japanese internment. Okay, I, I think when, 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 when it requires a longer-term public education and knowledge and people get an understand and work with each other, actually, as terrible as this situation currently is, and I think Combating this crisis requires global collaboration. It just happened that China and the United States are the most advanced in terms of the scientific and research and coming up with a solution. So in this critical moment, I think it requires collaboration, people working together for common good and for humanity. And I think this would create, you know, as far as I know, there are many American scientists and Chinese scientists are working day and night around the clock. And many of Chinese American scientists, scientists visiting from China, are part of those research team finding a solution. So hopefully, you know, we learn that in, in the moment of crisis, collaboration, working together is more important than ever. But, you know, I, I think all of us face racism in, in isolated cases here and there. And, and I think it's in, this will also pass in one day but hopefully this would also create an example, opportunity for collaboration, and hopefully in the long run, that adds to the understanding, the need for working together and communicate better. I think both countries, both all of us have that responsibility of doing that, stepping up our effort to communicate, to collaborate, to care about each other. And I think maybe if there's some positive lessons coming out of this crisis. I hope so, and I think Lisa had her hand up. Did you wanna say one more thing, Lisa? Yeah. I think uh, if we put this, uh, obviously we sort of uh, isolated this incident and also this pandemic alone. And then when we discuss discrimination, like issue of discrimination, we sort of isolate it from the bigger context. I think if we recall, like uh, because this thing has been on our minds for so long, so we don't even recall that what happened prior to this, which was the uh, heated conversation and negotiation with a trade war between U.S. and yeah. U.S. and China, and obviously with uh, in U.S. and Euro uh, European communities uh, with China. Um, so I think this the thing actually uh, is maybe sort of a way of of uh, manif make, ma allowing it to manifest. However, there was a deeper issue behind this. Um, it's just like the pandemic sort of 
uh, becoming an outlet for people to express like the fundamental uh, uh, stigma, uh, st uh, either it's stigma or discrimination. So I think I agree with Ch what Charlie just said, is that, is that if we were to address this, hopefully, uh, maybe it would be something good coming out of it, is that uh, if a, for a community to come together to really like bind together, because when, when he, uh, a human, um, human society have a tendency of binding together, in the face of large crisis. This is a way for us to like, if we can come together in dealing with this as a community, it might be helpful actually uh, having a, some sort of legacy beyond this, but then this will require like top down and bottom up approach yep. that allow that people to come together. Well, coming together and bonding together is really what all these conversations are meant to do in their small <laughs> way. And I really thank Lisa Lin, I thank Charlie Wu, uh, for joining us. It's a really, really important conversation, uh, and, and I appreciated all your insights. Um, a reminder that these conversations continue. Uh, you've both mentioned lessons learned. We have another in a, uh, a series of events, lessons learned, um, going country by country now. We did one on South Korea last week. Tomorrow night, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time in the United States, uh, we have Kevin Rudd, the president of our uh, Asia Society Policy Institute, in conversation with a leading public health official in Singapore, uh, where they have also uh, won high marks uh, for how they have dealt uh, with the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, we thank you all for watching and listening uh, today, wherever you may be. Uh, we hope you are well. We hope you stay safe. Uh, as we say here at the Asia Society, we are in this together. Thanks so much and have a great day.